Prohibition followed Barry into the 1920s. The first three months of 1926 saw 16 of 20 prisoners in the Barry Jail for operating stills or selling liquor. And then came the Great Depression. Dad went from living with maids and nursemaids and all that sort of thing uh, to working in Heinz Grocery Store on Dunlop Street for very little money. Although many families in Barrie struggled through the Depression era, by comparison, the town weathered the storm more so than other communities in Simcoe County because Barrie did not have a strong industrial base. The exception was Allendale. My dad worked full time on the railroad and then just overnight he worked one day a year. Fishing and ice harvesting on Kempenfelt Bay helped sustain a number of Barrie families through the Depression. However, the rise of electrical appliances, especially the refrigerator, and the deterioration of the water quality in the bay ground the industry to a halt. The Berry Tanning Company, um, Capaco Meat Packers, and Clark and Clark Tannery were all discharging um, their industrial wastes directly into the bay. Berry did not have, uh, in the 1930s, any municipal water treatment plant. As a young boy, Barry native Rainer McCullough spent his summers at the family cottage on Manette's Point. He remembers a day when going for a swim in Kempenfeld Bay meant waiting for a west wind. There was no way that we could get in the water till it was clear, and we would hope that the wind would come up from the west instead of in the mornings. It's so calm here, and you'd wait for the wind to come up and blow the sewage and whatever was left from Saturday nights straight out condoms. I didn't know what a condom was until I found them in the lake, brought one in and I was in trouble. That was the sewage plant in those days was just the lake. Over the years, Barry's waterfront has undergone a number of physical changes leading up to present day. Osmond J. Rowe, city solicitor for Barry from 1948 to 85, among other distinctions, was a member of the Barry Harbor Front Committee and the Centennial Park Committee in the 1960s. I got the idea that we would uh, try and do something with the waterfront. And uh, at that time, the railway line was uh, right on the water line. We uh, arranged to have some landfill put in. And Initially, there was a lot of opposition, a lot of feeling that we should not touch the natural state, which was a bog. I remember one organization said there would be no more ducks if we changed the natural habitat. This proved not to be true. There's more ducks here than ever. We accepted fill from people who were digging foundations for houses and stuff all over the town and that's where we got most of the land. One of the members of our committee sat in his car down on the, the beach front there, and he directed where the people who were bringing the soil in to dump it. That was the beginning of, uh, of the wonderful waterfront we have now, and after Centennial came Heritage Park, which was done the same way, and I don't suppose you could even do that today because that was all done without permits. Thank goodness we got it done. The advent of the Second World War helped break the back of the Depression in 1939. In Barrie, it was of special significance. In 1939, Barrie had a population of about 8,500 people. So imagine a community of that size having within 15 miles of its western borders a military camp with over 18,000 Armed Forces personnel. Barry became a garrison town. The population grew by 10% between 1939 and 40. Adequate housing became an issue, as did the resources to police the town. Then and now, base Borden continues to have a positive effect on the city economically and culturally. Whenever we are doing mer emergency planning, which you know happens pretty regularly, you always feel that you've got that backup out at Base Borden if you need it. Base Borden did indeed come to Barry's rescue when on Friday, May 31st, 1985, at approximately 4.30 p.m., the lights went out in Barry and a tornado touched down in the city's south end, killing eight people and leaving a path of destruction. She was like surreal. It was like you were in a war zone, but there was no war on. Everything was in black and white and dust. 
the neighbor next door to my son's house was blown away and his wasn't touched. Unbelievable. The tornado of 1985 was not the first natural disaster to hit Barry. On June 5, 1890, the town was hit by the worst electrical and rainstorm in recorded history. The violent rainstorm sent rivers of water down the steep Bayfield, Peel and Mulcaster streets and dug a 20 by 20 foot canal down Clapperton Street. Hurricane Hazel struck Barrie and the rest of central Ontario in 1954, washing out roads and knocking down bridges. Thousands were left homeless, 81 were killed. The tornado of 1985 will not soon be forgotten by many of Barry's residents. However, the resulting devastation did in turn set the city off in another new direction of economic prosperity as the South End rebuilt itself. Prime Minister Louis Saint Laurent came to Barry in 1953 to help mark the public celebration of the 100th anniversary of Barry as a municipality. It was one year after the official opening of a superhighway, Highway 400, on July 1st, 1952. The car is now king, as American companies took advantage of favorable labor costs and accessibility to Toronto. Barry is on the verge of finally coming to realize an industrial boom. By the mid-50s, Barry's population grew to 15,000 and in 1959 it was incorporated as a city, in large part due to the efforts of Mayor Willard L. Kinsey, the city of Barry's first mayor. I felt it would made good economic sense for us to become a city, plus we could control our own destiny. We could do those things that we wanted to do without having to go through another level of government. And I, again, proposed this to council, and I proposed it to the city, and we finally had a vote on the matter because it was very controversial, and the vote won by a large majority, and we became a city. I wanted our people to be a positive people, to think in a positive fashion, and to be very happy and proud of our city. Kinsey also realized the importance of an industrial base for Barry. As a result, much of his time was spent traveling throughout the United States, trying to interest American industrialists to relocate to Barry. From industries visiting our city and seeing the enthusiasm of our people, why they came here and established themselves here. If you, if you had the chance to be mayor again, would you? I would do all kinds of things. I still have ideas. Thanks. <laughs> In the space of a year, Barry's population grows by 5,000, totaling 20,000 in 1960. Land for housing development and industry is in demand. Sunnydale Park in Barry could just as easily have been part of that development. Once the site of a nine-hole golf course, its members wanted to move to another location. The year is 1968, and many are hoping the city would buy the land for a passive park with a price tag of $278,000. Twelve of 13 members of council, including the mayor, said no. Alderman Dorian Parker said yes. I said to Alderman Jack Garner at that time, was there any way that he would support it? And he said, no, it was a done deal. And I replied, I doubt that, Alderman Garner. Alderman Parker then acquired the services of Dr. Ted Beaton to head up a citizens committee that would be responsible for raising the necessary funds to save the park. We then set out with a, uh, a threefold mandate, raise money, arouse uh, uh, support and involvement, and put our foot in the door and keep pushing. Although the campaign fell short of the intended goal of $61,000, council took notice. We uh, achieved a sense of community, and I think that really impressed council. Uh, we uh, raised uh, uh, approximately $34,000. We got another 17 and a half acres added to a 36 basic uh, acreage. And finally, by 1971, after three years, with much more debate, controversy, the council agreed to vote on keeping the whole thing, so Barry got Sunnydale Park of 110 acres. Dorian Parker was a feisty alderman. 
and she was the catalyst in this entire Save the Park campaign. She was the one who stood up alone in council. She was the spark plug. When I see that sign, it sends chills up the back of my back. <laughs> I'm very proud. I'm so proud it makes me chilly. In 1968, Towers Department Store, located on Bayfield Street, sparks the shopping area known as the Bayfield Strip. Businessman Arch Brown relocates his Canadian tire store from the downtown core to Bayfield Street due to the lack of good arterial approaches from Highway 400 to the downtown core. It quickly becomes the southern anchor of Barrie's Golden Mile. 1968 also marks the opening of Georgian College in Barrie at the Wellington Street Plaza. Two years later, Highway 400 is widened to four lanes north of the city to the delight of cottagers and commuters. Barrie's population, 35,000. On January 1, 1987, the city annexes 942 acres from Innisfil Township and Barrie grows to 51,000. The 1990s sees tremendous growth with a new hospital constructed adjacent to the relocated Georgian College. And by the end of 1990, 100,000 people make Barry their home. Heritage Day in Barry arrives, but so does a nasty lady named Isabel. She may dampen the day, but not the spirit of a Barryite. The greatness, I think, of this community, it's its people. The people in this area from day one have proven to be enterprising, have proven to be vibrant, and have proven to be achievers. We are a powerhouse. We are the center of central Ontario. And I think in the future, we will continue to be that. They came by the waterway, and they came by the rail. Canoes on their back in a forest so black on the old portage trail. And at the head of the bay, well, they call Spirit, catch me. Deliver our dreams. Gather our children underneath your wings. Oh, Spirit, catch me. Sun. In this time of our own, in this place. 